I've got a little trivia question for you. What do Night Trap and the Pets games have in common? The development of both games was actually overseen by the same person. That's right, the guy who developed Night Trap, a game known for being both controversial and quite terrible, went on to start one of the most infamous franchises in gaming, though significantly less controversial, the Pet series. If that little bit of trivia impressed you, then prepare to have your mind blown. What if I told you the Pet series actually used to be good? <laughs> The original Pet series, developed by PF Magic, actually bears little resemblance to the Pet series of today. Back in the 90s, the Pets games were known for the unique and adorable art direction and their surprisingly complex breeding and AI systems for the time. The community is actually still alive today through various dedicated modders and some of their work is actually pretty darn cool. Alas, all things must come to an end. After the release of Pets 5 in 2002, the original Pet series was cancelled. What replaced it is the franchise that most people think of when they see the word Pets spelled with a Z. The modern pet series, rebooted by Ubisoft in 2006, is well known for its lazy, lackluster content, rather ugly graphics, and confusing interfaces. It's actually quite a shame that the pet's name has been forever soiled by the shovelware Ubisoft aims at unsuspecting children and their parents. But there is one game in particular in this rebooted franchise that I think deserves special attention. Pets Cats 2 on the Wii and PS2. Now, I'm aware that there's also a dog version called Pets Dogs 2, but I'm more of a cat person myself. As far as I can tell, the only difference between the two is that in cats, the pets are cats, and in dogs, the pets are dogs. I'm not sure why they have to be separate games, though, since the game only uses about one-fourth of the storage available on the disc, so you could easily fit dogs and cats on the same disc, but I guess they wanted you to buy two copies of the same game because money. We've got to have money. As aggravating as that sounds, so far this game doesn't look that bad. There are some cute cats on the cover, so that's a plus. The back of the box sounds promising too. It says there are over 40 breeds and that you can dress them up. It mentions multiplayer mini games as well as some kind of pet village mode? Well, that sounds interesting to say the very least. The official product description submitted by the developer to Amazon mentions that you can play with several toys including the new laser pointer, take pictures, teach the cat tricks, and even enter competitions. Well, with all that, there's no way this could possibly be bad. That looks sounds awesome. Let's jump right in. Okay, I know this is nitpicking, but the disc here is super boring to look at. Same with this Wii menu banner. But hey, whatever. I suppose it doesn't really matter. We see here that the game is developed by Ukes, a company that, as far as I know, hasn't touched any other games in the pet series before or after this. So, uh, that's interesting. Oh! 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 What is that? Something about these cats just looks... off. It took me a while to put my finger on exactly what it was, but I think it's that the cats have human eyes and human teeth. On otherwise realistic looking cat bodies, that looks really uncanny. Now we get to the main menu, and I gotta say, the two options here are continue and start. I find that a tad confusing that it says start instead of the more traditional new game, but it's not really a big deal, so whatever, let's just dive right in. Ah, first we get to choose our pet. Hmm. 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 <laughs> nah. Ah! This is just a tad bit irritating how you have to scroll through these cats one at a time. Wouldn't, like, a list where I could see all the breeds at once be a bit more intuitive? I mean, they're not even arranged in, like, any kind of order, so it's really hard to find a specific breed you want. Eh, whatever, I found one I like. Now I just gotta pick a name. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That'll do. Alright, let's start. I wanna raise my cat. Huh. So we're starting with the village building mode? Wait, it's a... it's a cutscene? The cats are talking? Magic hat? What the? Wait a minute. Hearts in the upper left corner. Pushing boxes around, fighting monsters, collecting three pure elements in order to obtain the full power of a weapon that will stop the big bad from controlling an all-powerful artifact and ruling the world? This isn't a pet raising simulator! This is a Legend of Zelda ripoff. Oh, and I'm not just being harsh. Ripoff is the best way to describe this. You enter your name to play as a silent protagonist who is accompanied by an annoying little fairy partner who levels up hearts by completing side quests and who wears different outfits in order to avoid damage from extreme temperatures, and you go fishing. 
I mean, the clumps of grass even look like something taken directly out of Wind Waker. So as it would turn out, this game was originally released in Japan under the name the Kitten and the Magic Hat, or the Puppy and the Magic Hat if you're playing the dog version, released as a spiritual successor to the fairly obscure game The Dog Island, which most people only know because the Game Grumps played it. For some reason, when they released it in the US and Europe, they rebranded it as part of the Pets franchise, despite it having absolutely nothing to do with the Pets franchise. I'll give this game the benefit of the doubt and judge it for what it is. I mean, an adventure game geared towards a younger audience isn't really a bad idea if you think about it. I'm just a little annoyed that they blatantly lie to you about what kind of game this is on the back of the fucking box, but whatever. So let's just take it at face value. So, in this game you take on the role of a cat living in Pawville. Your father, Arvin, is telling you again about the magic hat, a Triforce slash one ring kind of object that keeps the peace on this island. But even though it's never happened before, Arvin knows that a person with an evil heart could use the hat's power to destroy the world. One thing I find kind of amusing is that if you don't advance the dialogue here, the cats just kind of keep meowing on loop. Your good friend Victor comes over and he tells you about a new prisoner on the island named... Ivelet. Though due to the font they choose, I always read this in my head as Livlet, because you know, the I and the L look identical in this font. Victor wants to go see the prisoner, which is kind of an odd thing for a kid to want to go see, but anyway, the two head off. Why do they have doorknobs for these characters to push the door open without using the knobs anyway? The two cats see Livlet, who is asleep, and they are caught by the prison guard, Ada, who chases them out. Victor is disappointed because he really wanted to see this prisoner. But you two walk off, where we finally get to go to our first bit of gameplay. Victor wants to play Cops and Robbers, probably because he has prisoners and his crime on his mind right now, and this serves as your walking tutorial. Now, you're probably thinking something along the lines of, oh, I guess that's nice, this game offers an explanation on how to walk. After all, this game is clearly intended for a younger audience, and this may be the first time using an analog stick. So, it makes sense that they might need some help. No, that would actually be a clever thing to do. Instead, this game has you control your movement in the single most nonsensical and unresponsive method I can ever imagine. Instead of just walking by holding down an analog stick, you instead have to point your Wii remote at the screen and hold down the B button. When doing this, your cat will walk in the direction the cursor is currently pointing. And it moves painfully slow for areas this large, mind you. I think that maybe they chose to do this because they thought an analog stick would be too hard for children to understand, but since every other game in the world uses one too, I think it actually probably would have been a better decision for them to just make this game use an analog stick. That way, kids playing a video game for the first time would get pretty good at just walking around using nothing but an analog stick in a pretty safe and simple environment. But instead, this way, a kid gets no better at controlling a game, because no other game in the world has such a stupid control scheme. Additionally, these controls are horribly imprecise, leading you to often get stuck on ledges or walls. As if that wasn't enough, it also gets tiring to have your arm pointed upwards at the screen your entire play session. This has to be the single worst movement system I have ever seen implemented in a video game. At the very least, they should have given the players an option to use an analog stick, especially because in the PS2 version of the game, you move only with an analog stick, so clearly the developers knew that they existed and had a program for them and not. As soon as you start playing, this game throws several text boxes of tutorial right at your face. I don't know what kids they think can't handle an analog stick, but would be perfectly okay reading through all these tutorials and retaining all this information thrown at them at once. Once those are out of the way, you start playing. And he's caught. Take that, Victor. After that's done, Victor wants you to play robbers with him. Interesting that both the games he wants to play deal with criminals, and that he was also super interested in visiting the captured criminal Livlet in prison? This minigame serves as the tutorial for the sniff mechanic, which returns from the Dog Island. In the Dog Island, you had a radar that would blink as you approached a buried object. In this game, you just kind of follow an arrow that appears on screen. Apparently, they didn't think the old method was simple enough. When you find the object, you shake the Wii remote to dig it up. I despise this input. It is just plain unresponsive sometimes, and other times I find it hyper-responsive. I'll sit there shaking my arm sometimes as the cat just sits around not digging anything when I need him to dig, but other times when I'm just moving my arm to run, the cat starts digging randomly. So would it be a problem if you didn't run with the goddamn pointer or if digging was mapped to a button? So for this minigame, Victor has hidden his bug net and fishing tackle on the beach for us to find. I love how whenever they describe a scent to you, it just says that you've learned the scent. Oh god, watch out for the snakes! You know, Victor, there's probably a better place to play your prison games than on the snake beach. Just a thought. 
Oh, well, I got him. It's easy enough. One recurring issue with this game is that whenever you get a new object, an obnoxiously huge text box appears over the screen. When this happens, the game is still running, meaning that you can be hit by enemies you couldn't see because there's a text box in the way. Why couldn't this just be a smaller text box or like put along the bottom or top of the screen or something? Look how easy it is to fix. I just fixed it right there. Why don't they just do that? When you're done the game, you're given a chance to save. I find it annoying how after saving, instead of returning you to the game, you're still on the save screen. Then you hit the B button and it gives you an annoying prompt about being sure you want to exit the menu. I already saved, you don't need to ask me. It's not a big issue, but it's something I thought I'd mention. The enemies in this game also have these symbols over their heads that describe their current states, though I find them more confusing to understand than simply looking at the enemy. What's the point of them? Combat itself is understandably simple, I mean it is a kid's game. You just sneak up behind something and meow at it. I understand they're trying to be non-violent here, but it's just so unsatisfying to defeat enemies in this game, especially because it only temporarily defeats them. If that doesn't suit your fancy though, you can always just clonk enemies on the head with a rock. I also kind of enjoy how you can use your meow attack to harass the wildlife. I don't know, I, I'm a citizen person, it's fun. Anyways, now Victor wants us to go catch bugs. So instead of just clicking on the bug to catch it, you click on the bug and enter this minigame screen, and then in the minigame screen you click on the bug again and you caught it. So the game just pointlessly wastes your time whenever you want to catch a bug. Victor tells you you need to catch a cabbage white, which is apparently this yellow butterfly here. I kind of expected the cabbage white to be white, but eh, it's fine. And then you have to fish! And if you thought fishing with Big the Cat was bad, wait until you see this. All you do is cast your line, wait, and then shake. You have no way to influence what kind of fish you catch, which is especially annoying when you need a specific one for a quest in this game, or when you only need a few more to fill out your aquarium. So as the cats are done playing on the beach, they have to walk back when they are stopped by Augusta, this cat with terrible music. <coughs> Augusta here stops just to tell us that Livlet is bad. Bad, bad, bad to the tips of his paws. After wasting your time, the, these cats just kind of leave and Augusta just sits here and meows to herself like a crazy old bitch. After that's done, you go back home where your mom asks you to deliver these odd octagonal donuts to everyone in town. I really love how she lists out every single person in town for you to bring donuts to, except for Clara. Clara also happens to be the only cat in town who doesn't have a house to live in. Poor thing. Oh, hold on, did he just hand me four gold? The currency in a game about talking cats in a village is gold? Something about that seems a little odd to me. This isn't like some high fantasy D&D-esque world. It's cats wearing ridiculous outfits, being handed donuts. I don't know, I just feel like gold's kind of an odd choice for currency. Also, is no one going to mention the odd glowing uh, Sheikah stone that just sits here on the edge of town? No? Okay then. God, eh, eh, go, uh, j just, just go down! These controls give you no physical feedback, it makes navigating so frustrating. Not to mention the fact that the cat cannot just jump down the ledge like any other video game character could. Alrighty, now it's finally night. Victor had arranged with PoopDick28 here to go meet Livlet down at the town prison when night fell. Livlet strikes up a conversation with the two youngsters, steering it towards the magic hat that rests on this island. Livlet says he doesn't believe that the hat is real, and that he will only believe it's real if they bring it to him. Now, I don't care how young they expected their player to be, because any kid that's old enough to understand how a video game works is going to see it, this is clearly a trap. But apparently these cats are dumber than your average bag of chips because they actually believe him. And so your character goes and retrieves the magic hat, which Livlet admits is the real thing. However, he also tells them that the hat is ripped despite the fact that the two cats can't see any tears in it. Livlet says he will show them exactly where the rip is as long as they bring it closer to him. And I don't care how stupid you are, there's no way this trick would work on anyone. Except for this incredibly idiotic cat, apparently, who actually proceeds to hand the most dangerous criminal in the world the all-powerful object that he was just told earlier today must never fall in the hands of evil. Livlet dons the hat as this annoying mute starts playing and... <laughs> Are you serious? He looks ridiculous! Is he supposed to look like a threat? Because to me, it just looks like he's auditioning for the role of the villain on one of those parody TV shows that only exists within other TV shows or video games or something. You, you know what I mean. Well, Livlet escapes from the cell, and the two cats race back to town to stop him and... Jesus Christ! <laughs> Holy shit! I take back everything I just said. Livlet is not fucking around today. I can't help but feel like this scene is somewhat out of place in this so far incredibly child-friendly game. Like, look, it's so, it's so violent! Wait, that's it? 
Livlet just shows up, blows up a few houses, and leaves? What exactly was he hoping to accomplish? He just left everyone alive and fled the scene to go brood somewhere? <laughs> oh my god, they throw you in jail for this? I like how your own parents don't even show up and try to help you out, or even say goodbye to you or anything. That Augusta cat from earlier comes and says that you should be let out to help rebuild the town because it was your fault. Victor then begs to be locked in jail and, okay, this cat has a prison fetish. He wanted nothing more than to see a real prisoner in person. Both the games you played with you on the beach had to do with crime and the law, and now this? What the? What is that? Well, this gingerbread man says his name is Beat. He's basically Navi, but somehow even more useless. He explains that he is the manifestation of the good half of the magic hat, and was booted out by Livlet, who has taken the evil half over. But wait, why is there an evil half? Who the hell made this hat and gave it an evil half? Beat explains that Livlet allowed himself to be caught so that he would be imprisoned here, just so he could get his hands on the magic hat. But wait, how did he know he'd be brought to a prison here? You can't seriously expect me to believe that this dinky little island has the highest security prison in the world, can you? And when he did get here, what was his plan? Did he know that there'd be two stupid cats who just hand him the hat? Is Victor working cahoots with Livlet? Your father then talks to you and finally initiates the real game. He tells you that you need to repair the town since it was your fault that it got destroyed. And I actually really like the idea behind the moral here, that you need to take responsibility for your own actions and fix your own mistakes, as well as the moral that rules exist for a reason but I have a few problems with the execution here. For starters, Yacht Wright tells you that you aren't allowed to go after Livlet and the adults will handle it without you. But then at the end of the game, you defy his rules here and go and stop Livlet yourself. So, okay, that's a confusing message, but I think that's the lesser of the two problems here. They tell you that you need to repair the town because after all, it's your fault it's destroyed. Except that it's not. Maybe it's just me here, but immersion in a game is a big part of how much I enjoy it. And this game created one huge break between the player and the character they're playing as. Don't know what I mean? I'm talking about the way the cat handed Livlet the magic hat. Still don't get it? All right, let me explain. When you bring the spiritual stones to the Temple of Time and Ocarina of Time and open up the gate to the Sacred Realm, Ganondorf swoops in and seals the Triforce. This allows him to destroy the world and Link must restore it because it's his fault the world is ruined. But it's not just Link's fault, it's the player's fault too. The player went and retrieved the spiritual stones, thus opening up the gates of the Sacred Realm and allowing Ganondorf to seal the Triforce. The player in Ocarina of Time is tricked into doing this. And sure, I get that this is a kid's game, and maybe a kid would be tricked by Livlet here, but I still don't think this justifies this for one simple reason. Even if the player fully believed Livlet's lie here, the player still didn't bring Livlet the hat. The stupid cat did. It was a cutscene, where the cat got the hat and handed it to Livlet. If I had to walk and get the hat myself, at least I'd understand why I, the player, am being punished right now. But I didn't. And to make matters worse, this game has absolutely no problem making you walk back and forth across the world tediously for the rest of its duration, where it is far more tedious and far less plot relevant. This is the one time where walking back and forth in this game would add anything to it, and the game somehow managed to screw this up. This is the rest of the game then, by the way. The player is forced to repair the town as a punishment for the cat's actions, and it feels like a punishment the whole time for a crime I did not commit. Right before you can begin your first quest, Beat has to explain how the saving stones work. Right after he explains it, a tutorial pops up and explains the exact same thing to you. Thank you, Fi. The first quest has us sifting out some cutting down at Lappy Lake for the drugstore. Why can't this stupid cat climb up or down here? It's not that far to step. This may sound like a nitpick, but it gets super aggravating as the game progresses. Whenever you finish a quest, this overly happy music plays and you get awarded more gold that you'll likely never spend. Also, jeez, a hundred gold? To repair the shop that I ruined? You're far too kind, Gertrude. After that, you get set down to Tom at the pawn shop, who informs you that he's twisted his paw. Ah, yes, and which one of your paws was injured, Tom? They all look perfectly fine to me. Ah, well. You have to find an herb so that Gertrude at the drugstore can make the medicine to help Tom. She tells you that it smells like a combination of strawberry and pansy. Interesting. If only I could sell things in this game like in real life. 
Not only does she tell you, but a tutorial pops up saying that for certain items you can't smell them until you found the things they smell like, meaning that I can't find this herb until I found both strawberries and pansies following their smell. Oh yeah? Well I'll prove you wrong, because as soon as you enter Jade Fields, it just lets you sniff it out like any other quest item. I feel like this could be a glitch actually, because in the Dog Island, some items could not be found until you did find the other items that smelled like it. But in this game, it doesn't work. Come on, did they playtest this? I'd think this would be a really simple thing to catch. After that, you're sent over to Whisker Woods to find a cat named Saul who went missing a short time ago. Despite being on the other end of the woods, we can hear him as soon as we enter it. Saul here claims that his foot has been caught in a snake's hole, so we need to get him out of it. He also said he dropped his top quality canned fish and asked us to pick it up. You know, Saul, your paw doesn't really look like it's been stuck in a snake hole right now. The game introduces two new mechanics here. One is Crouch and Crawl, which allows us to stealth past enemies and is completely pointless because you can easily run right past them. And the Whisker Radar, which allows you to follow paw prints in the ground to find hidden items, like the top quality canned fish, which is impossible to get for some reason due to this game's rather unfinished of everything. It's supposed to be right here, you just keep digging, it doesn't come up. The woods are so confusing to navigate because everything here looks the same. And the music sounds like the opening notes from Ocarina of Time. As a thanks for rescuing him, Saul gives you a hat. G. Thanks, Saul. Saul then expresses his concern that the town's flower bed has been destroyed. You know, Saul, many cats just lost their homes. I have bigger things to worry about than the goddamn flower bed. But now we have to go see the town hobo Clara about the flower bed to progress the game. Clara says you need bricks to repair the flower bed. Well, where does one obtain bricks? From Stanley the Carpenter? No, from the zoo, of course. What the fuck, Clara? What made you come to the conclusion that the zoo, of all places, is where I can get new bricks? Apparently, the zoo is the only place in the world making bricks right now. Oh, but wouldn't you know it, they're all out of clay. Off to Jay Fields to get clay so the zookeeper can make more bricks. Clara then expresses concern that the fashion house has been destroyed. Clara, you can't even afford a home. Why should the fashion house be your biggest concern right now? Shelia says that she wants to lift the spirits of everyone in town with some new fashion designs and asks you to help her track down the legendary patter. Created by a cat named Townsend. Where exactly did he send the town? Anyway, Townsend is dead right now, but he has a son who apparently knows the legendary Patter. And probably has a much less stupid name, so it's off to find Townsend's son. Ada, the cop from earlier, apparently knows where to find Townsend's son at, so we must seek her out. Why don't we check up an old Victor while we're at the prison? Damn, Victor, you got a crush? Well, I guess it makes sense considering your fetish and that she's the one who imprisoned you and all. So now that we're here, Ada tells us that in order to find Townsend's son, we need to talk to Augusta. Shelia sends you to talk to Ada, who sends you to talk to Augusta, who sends you to Townsend's son. So basically, they all just waste my time. On the way to Augusta, Beat gets distracted by a prairie dog? Beat, what the fuck? We have bigger things to worry about than this stupid gopher. But now we're forced to play this minigame for some reason, where you have to sniff out a prairie dog while it digs underground. It's actually a really cool idea, except that I can just see the fucking prairie dog's shadow as it tunnels around, completely negating the entire point of the minigame's use of the sniff mechanic. Augusta says that Townsend's son, whose name is Sai, by the way, is over at Lappy Lake, so it's back there to meet the cat himself. Sai tells you that he and his father used to eat cherry pie together, and that if you bring him a cherry pie, he'll help you out. He then proceeds to explain where your own house is so you can ask your mother for a pie. I'd be insulted here except this is the cat who handed the evil villain the magic hat in the first place, so I really don't blame Sai for expecting you to be a complete moron and not know where your own house is. Oh, but guess what? You're all out of cherries, so your mother sends you up to Whisker Woods to get some more, but apparently cherries aren't a quest item, and are instead one of the random pickups which means that you need to keep sifting out object after object aimlessly until you eventually get lucky and one of them happens to be a cherry. Oh, but it gets worse because if you are out of range of the object, it doesn't even point you in the direction of the nearest one. At this point I've forgotten what this quest was even for in the first place. Well, we got the cherries, spy is finished, back to Sai who finally hands us the legendary petter so we can give it to Shelia. Does this sound like a side quest? Because it's not, this is actually a mandatory part of the game. Well, now we're off to repair the aquarium, even though it really doesn't look that broken. Come on, Charles, it just looks like some rubble's been knocked over. By the way, Charles is my least favorite character in this game, and you'll see why later on. Well, Charles agrees that the aquarium isn't too bad, because the only thing he wants repaired is the sign, apparently made by the town's kittens. What kittens? Where the hell do they live? I've been all over this town and I ain't seen kittens. There's only like three houses here. But Charles insists that we find him some signwood in order to make a new sign. Signwood. 
What exactly differentiates sign wood from normal wood? Well, it's off to Whisker Woods again to find the sign wood. You know, sniffing things out as a gameplay mechanic is starting to get just a little old. It's not a challenge, you just walk in the direction the arrow points you. Got your stupid sign wood, Charles. Well, now we're off to see Godfrey to repair the water wheel. He tells us to get Stanley the Carpenter to fix it. Alright, time to go seek out Stanley because I... I are you kidding me? What the fuck, Godfrey? Were you fucking lazy to walk 15 feet to the side to go ask Stanley to repair the water wheel? Well, apparently Stanley is too busy repairing houses to work on the water wheel now. Alright, I guess that's fair. I... Uh... What the fuck, Stanley? Apparently, Stanley is too busy walking in circles to help repair the water wheel right now. Repairing house is my ass. I've been the one cleaning up the town. Not you, Stanley. We're supposed to feel bad for running the town, but as far as I can tell, everyone in this town is kind of just a lazy asshole is more than happy to have some stupid kid doing free labor for them. Godfrey insists that you repair the water wheel because of some tragic backstory he has about it, and says that your father is wise and can probably think of a way to speed up Stanley's work. Just saying, Godfrey, my father can't be all that wise because he just left the magic hat sitting on the table in the front room of the house. Your father suggests that you find something to motivate Stanley, and that reminds you of where Stanley is because even he thinks you're an idiot after the hell hat incident. Stanley says he's motivated by music and that he apparently didn't bring his iPod or something to work with him, so he says you should ask your dad how he can listen to music while he works. I just talked to my dad 10 seconds ago and you're sending me all the way back there again, what the fuck? Your dad says there's a kind of bug that can make music, called an orchestra insect male. I don't know why he didn't just go the conventional way of speaking and call it a male orchestra insect, but whatever. He says in order to find it, you have to go somewhere else to talk to someone else about something else. You know, I'm really starting to notice a pattern here. Someone will be too lazy to do a chore themselves, will ask you to accomplish it, which involves you finding something. But to find it, you have to talk to someone who tells you 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 to talk to someone who finally has you tediously sniffing out whatever it is you need, all the while dealing with the awful controls and the loading screens. This time, we're talking to Warren at Dolphin Coast, who works for the... university. And then we're back to Jade Fields to sniff out something else. And then we got the fucking music bug. Stanley claims that'll make him finish his work only one third of the time. But since he was doing zero work before, and zero divided by three is still zero, he realizes he had nothing to do all along and instantly gets to work on the water wheel. Thanks for that, Wild Goose Chase. Oh, and then they just randomly bring up the call mechanic out of nowhere? Why do they do that? What, what does calling have to do with anything? Well, I'm confused by calling, so it's back to Lappy Lake to learn about calling from Sai. Oh wait, you can't possibly think this would be that easy, could you? No, of course not. Sai says he won't teach you the call mechanic unless you bring him a fucking pear tart. Which means it's back home to my mom to ask for a pear tart and she just back off to look for pears, and guess where they are? Why, they're back at Lappy Lake, of course, the place I just fucking was a few seconds ago. I'm getting real tired of this shit game. Well, Sai teaches us how to call, which allows us to summon dolphins to get rides on to go across water, which is a mechanic we won't use so much later in the game, so thank you for wasting my time, Sai. Oh, Godfrey has another task for us! Apparently, Livlet just froze the waterfall, which feeds the river the water wheel is on. Doesn't Livlet have anything better to do than freeze a random river? Why is Livlet still terrorizing this island? Hasn't he moved on to taking over the world by now? Well, luckily, your father has just the thing to unfreeze the river. A warm stone. I really don't know what I was expecting. Why does the warm stone sound like a female sex toy? Well, back to Whisker Woods to unfreeze the waterfall. <sighs> Hurry up! This pan goes on forever! Wait a second. Is this the river that leads to the water wheel? Because it doesn't look frozen from over here, it's flowing the same as it always has. I'm sorry, Godfrey, but the frozen waterfall clearly isn't impacting the river at all. There must be some kind of dam in between this part of the river and, and the water wheel. If unfreezing it will make you happy, I guess it'll do... I'm done. So then you go to Augusta to teach you how to push rocks, yay, and now we're off. Now I guess we can do some knockoff Zelda box puzzles. Then we head to Kenneth who wants help repairing his zoo. Hey, 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 it's Fat Kenneth. Kenneth wants help repairing the zoo. Apparently, Godfrey offered to help Kenneth repair the zoo, but only if he gets to read Kenneth's romance novel first.
Look, at this point, I'm beyond questioning the motives of these townspeople. It's clear to me that not a single one of them wants to do anything or gives a rat's ass about which kind of shape the town's in, so long as you fix their specific problem. Kenneth sends you a tale heist to retrieve the romance novel from Daisy, which is finally a new location. Just gotta trek through Lappy Lake for the 50th time and get stuck on the goddamn Lappy Lake ledges! Oh, we can't go to Tail Heights until Stanley fixes the bridge, which as you can see, Stanley is just standing here staring at the bridge instead of fixing the fucking bridge. Apparently, his orchestra insect, male, has stopped working, and we need to go ask Warren why. Not like Stanley has anything better to do right now, so we gotta run all the way back to Warren at Dolphin Coast, where I just was to learn about how to push fucking rocks a few seconds ago. Warren tells us that if we get an orchestra insect, female, the orchestra insect, male, will play music again. So it's back to Whisker Woods to get the stupid bug and then back to Lappy Lake to give it to Stanley. Alright, I am finally ready to see a new location in this game. I am so sick of this shit. What, you just teleport to Daisy? You don't get to explore Tail Heights? How unfulfilling! At least we got the stupid romance novel. Finally, we got something useful in this game. Your father gives you the warp ring, a magic ring given to him by the wizard Theophilus. What the fuck? There are wizards now too? Why haven't they been mentioned before? Why aren't they trying to stop Livlet? Now you've got the, the warp ring, so you can warp between these different stones. This makes those fetch quests mildly more tolerable, except you can only warp between these six locations. Now we're heading back to Charles, because he wants us to expand his fish tank, which can only be done with a, a lava stone? What the fuck is a lava stone? How would a lava stone help expand a fish tank? Back to fucking Whisker Woods or his fucking lava stone. Hey, it's Victor! Talking about how he wants to get to know Ada better. Yeah. Speaking of Ada, she has a problem. This pig here has stolen some junk for her. And if you want me to be more specific, I can't actually. She just calls it junk and even says it's worthless. But it's very special to her, so we have to go get it from the pig. Damn it, Ada, you could have just gotten this yourself. Then she says you can keep the junk and turn it into a guitar? What? First off, what? Second, if you're going to let me keep the junk, then why'd you say it was very special to you? If you don't care who has the junk, why'd you need me to waste my time getting it back from the pig? Well, now Augusta wants to throw rocks at this bird, and okay, am I almost done yet? I'm almost done solving everyone's fucking problems, because for a game about taking responsibility, no one in this town seems to want to take responsibility. Sure, I can help to clean up the damage that's been done, but getting junk back from a pig, retrieving a romance novel, throwing a rock at a fucking bird, I'm not fixing my damage anymore, I'm doing chores for these lazy fuckers. You know what? I want Livlet to come here right now and kill all of you with that fucking purple fire right this instant. Hey everyone, and thank you very much for watching the first episode of the Fishbowl Reviews. This series has been a long, long way coming. I've spent nearly two years preparing for this first upload, so I hope you all enjoyed it. Part 2 isn't quite ready yet, but in the meantime, why don't you click the little eye notification icon in the upper right corner and vote in the poll I've set up. Hope to see you all in the second episode.